All right, Salam Alaikum. Thank you so much for joining us for the Pleasanton uh, City Council Candidates Forum. My name is Samina Usman. I'm the Government Relations Coordinator for the Council on American Islamic Relations, um, the nation's largest uh, civil rights advocacy organization. Um, so, you know, we have co we have co sponsored uh, this event with the MCC East Bay, uh, the San Ramon Valley Islamic Center, the Northern California Islamic Center, and the Muslim American Society. Um, so, what our goal for all of these forums is to um, forms is to mobilize the Muslim community uh, to let them know about the candidates to you know quote unquote meet with their candidates. We would love to have done so in person and have some chai and some snacks. But uh, you know the best thing you could do is just grab a bag of popcorn and uh, and enjoy this uh, forum. So you know we uh, care is a. Uh, um, Nonprofit civil rights advocacy organization. We are 501c4, so we cannot endorse any of the candidates. Um, however, we can just pr provide you the information by having you meet with them. We also provide voter guides. And so if you haven't checked it out yet, we have a Care California voter guide, which analyzes the votes of our congressional members and our state legislators as well. Um, and you can find that at bit.ly slash CARE CA vote. Um, and you can also find our local voter guides where we analyze the ballot measures of, uh, of nine Bay Area counties. Um, and, you know, we have taken positions on certain ballot measures that deal with civil rights issues. Um, and then also you could have found the, uh, the propositions, our, our positions on the propositions as well. We also have information about the, the different propositions like Prop 15, Prop 16, Prop 17, um, and then also know your rights information um, at the ballot box. Uh, so please go ahead and check that out at our uh, website. Again, that's bit.ly uh, forward slash care CA votes. Um, and, uh, with, and then also, um, oh yeah, without further ado, let's go ahead and, uh, ask the questions. I'm going to go ahead and put the first question in the chat group. Um, we are going to try to do this as alphabetically as possible so that we can, um, make sure that no candidate has an advantage of the other, uh, since, um, um, so we're going to go by last name. And this uh, first question goes to Ms. Arkin, and it would be uh, to give an introduction of yourself. Please include your involvement in the city and what your top three priorities are if you're elected. Okay, great, thank you. Good evening, I'm Valerie Arkin, running for the Pleasanton City Council. Mm. I am a current school board member in Pleasanton, and I have been on the board for 12 years. Um, I've contributed to that financial stability and award-winning programs that make our school district one of the best in the state. Number 11, I believe. Um, as an elected official, I've always been accessible and responsive to community input and feedback, and I'll continue to do that as a city council member. I was a library commissioner in Pleasanton for eight years. I turned out in 2014. I'm a 27-year resident of Pleasanton, and I've raised my three children here. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in health science, and I have a master's degree in business, an MBA. And I currently work at Hively, which is a nonprofit here in Pleasanton that provides resources to families in need. My priorities, um, I have about five, so it's hard to just pick the three because all five are important. But smart growth in the environment, um, supporting the school district and, the, and our educational system, preserving the downtown, and COVID recovery. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so Mr. Balsh? Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Jack Balch. Uh, I'd like to express my thanks in being here and being invited. Uh, so I grew up in the Snow Fremont border and went to Snow Glen Elementary School, raised pigs through Snow 4-H, and have uh, been in the area my entire life. Um, I'm honored to have served Pleasanton for over a decade, where 11 years ago I joined the Park and Recreation Commission, uh, where I served for nearly five years. And now I'm serving you as a planning commissioner for the past six. I've been a certified public accountant nearly my entire life and my adult life. And uh, I've been in a business and finance role for more than 21 years. Pleasanton is an amazing community. We have growing diversity and an exciting future. As we look to this future, I believe we can um, get Pleasanton going and use our experience to help Pleasanton recover in these economic times. And my priorities are promoting that economic recovery strengthening our city school partnership and recommitting ourselves to keeping our neighborhood safe. Thank you.
Sorry, thank you, Mr. Brown. Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Randy Brown, and I believe there are many paths to civic leadership. And I believe that be, to be a truly effective and dynamic council, it will consist of members who bring varied experiences and opinions to the table. The issues facing our community today uh, are fairly clear. Public safety, economic stability, housing, traffic, and preservation of local resources. These are all priorities that I have. If you want to ask me my top three, it would be public safety, economic stability and recovery, and housing. The question is, who do you want making this decision, these decisions based on, uh, or these decisions based on behalf of Pleasanton? I believe we need leaders who are honest, balanced, committed, and motivated. Leaders who have a deep, set, deep sense of integrity, and leaders who embrace a collaborative spirit, and who will approach each situation with an unbiased perspective. I'm eager to bring my unique background of mil military and business leadership coupled with community volunteerism to the role of city council. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Sorry, Serena? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Serena Kuzulolu. I'm running for, I've been a housing commission for three years. I'm running for city council with the platform with centering around three major issues, affordable housing, investment in mental health, social services, and building a strong community through inclusion. COVID-19 and movement of Black Lives Clear and show how systematically harming people of color and getting in the way of the Bay Area we want to live in. Pleasant affluent communities have created segregation, and segregation create, creates concentrated areas of poverty, inequity, and access to education, economic environment, and other opportunities for minorities, Blacks, and Latinx. As a housing commissioner, we, we made motion to get rid of in fees and basically built affordable housing. Um, but the city council uh, did not adhere to our recommendation. So this housing, as a Pleasanton City Council, uh, is, is a board of directors of Pleasanton, um, housing authority and have to make the changes within. So that's why I'm running for city council to affirmatively for the fair housing in our city. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lee? You're muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> hey, my name is Chimin Lee. I wanna thank everyone for uh, attending this event. Um, I'm running for Pleasanton City Council. I'm the son of Hong Kong immigrants and the youngest of three siblings. I was born and raised in San Francisco. I'm currently the Director of Operations at Corporate E-Waste Solution, a uh, e-waste um, sustainability company. Um, I lived in uh, Pleasanton for about seven years and really saw a big focus on big business and the disconnect from small business and the community and our environment. Uh, my top three positions are um, supporting small businesses and families through this COVID pandemic, uh, protecting our local environment and our water, and really highlighting the need for diversity in our city council and our cities. Um, you know, really, um, I wanted to raise awareness to, you know, folks with different cultural backgrounds and really have a seat on the table so that we can highlight that and um, promote that diversity. Thank you very much. All right, for the, so before I go to the second question, I just wanna um, remind the audience that are both on Zoom and also on Facebook Live that you can ask your questions and uh, we'll try to incorporate that into uh, the, the questions that we have. Uh, we did receive some questions from uh, community members ahead of time as well. And so I've also, I've already incorporated that into the questions. So please uh, make sure to, to ask them and then we'll, we'll go ahead and incorporate that. Um, so for the second question, uh, what is, the, oh, oops, I think I accidentally included a wrong question, forgive me. <laughs> this one. Um, here we go. So as of October 12th, Pleasanton had a confirmed number of 475 COVID cases and in Alameda County as a whole had 22,000 cases. This pandemic has shaken our communities through sickness and loss of life, along with negatively impacting the economy. How should the city of Pleasanton be involved in the recovery as we deal with the COVID-19 crisis? And the question will go to Mr. Balch. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think this is a challenge that we have not 
seen or foreseen, and it's challenging us to be innovative in so many different ways. The way that I think that the city should be uh, addressing this is, is similar to what they are doing, right? We are doing rental assistance for our residents. We're doing rental assistance or financial assistance for our businesses. We're working to open up businesses in a safe manner by providing them additional space, like shutting down Main Street, something that was proposed years ago, but was unheard of or unwilling to be considered. And so as we look to the future, Pleasanton needs to continue to see what opportunities exist within the county guidelines to be able to assist our residents in those areas and those businesses. But we also need to continue to be flexible with it. The downtown specific plan has a few economic suggestions that I think can be implemented to help uh, businesses throughout the community, not just focusing on the downtown. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Brown. Well, we need to really rally around our business community right now with COVID. We need to get them back to work and continue to work to support them in every way possible. But at the same time, while keeping our residents safe, we certainly need to continue to work hard with our downtown and our restaurants by giving them the abilities to open up and, and serve people. I worked hard to, to get the downtown opened up for restaurants, and we need to look at that as more of a permanent fixture because we don't know how long COVID is going to, uh, that we're going to have to deal with it. It may be something that we just have to live with, but hopefully not. Um, but we also need to look at maybe in the future by closing down some parking spaces and opening up some parkettes for them as well. Um, we need to continue to work with businesses and make it more easy and accessible for them to open up uh, new businesses as some of the old business or other businesses may have gone out. Um, they're entrepreneurs and they're, they have an entrepreneur spirit, so they'll be back. We just need to make it as easy as possible for them. Thank you. Ms. Kizuko? Yes, so this has been really difficult for business and people, also the elderly and the you know, children. So, um, you know, downtown businesses opened up and I'm, I'm happy that it's open, but at the same time, I'm not quite sure if it's very safe for people to be in close contacts. Yes, the streets are closed on uh, Saturdays and Sundays, so people are sitting outside. You know, and, and if you're walking up and down, you're wearing masks, that's all good. But, you know, the economic re recovery is going through the um, Chamber of Commerce and the city. They're doing a great job. They're fantastic. I'm not going to repeat that. But as far as the safety and now opening up the schools without consulting the teachers and the students, I am concerned. I know that Palo Alto opened up recently and uh, their schools and they're opening up at least uh, K through five and we're opening in, in January. Uh, without teachers and, and high school inputs, I'm worried about us opening up altogether. Um, it, this is a difficult time. We have to see how the numbers go. And 475 is is pretty large number for a city of 70,000. Mr. Lee? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, the city is doing the best they can to help out local businesses. Um, we developed that uh, small business loan, zero interest loan. But I think we need to do more as a city. Um, I think that small businesses, they're kind of struggling to kind of figure out how to navigate COVID and how to kind of comply with Alameda County health uh, um, policies that changes every, every week or so. So uh, we really need to look at um, starting some sort of task force to help small businesses to navigate that, you know, helping, giving free support to small businesses so that they can find this updated info, they can find grant zero interest loans and even help with uh, getting permits to open up and not just focusing on small business, I mean, uh, downtown uh, businesses, but uh, businesses throughout Pleasanton, right? Um, we also need more testing, more contact tracing so that we are that's the end. Thank you. Safe. Uh, Ms. Arkin? <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, the, the loans to small businesses and more so to the downtown businesses that the city has been doing, I'm absolutely in favor of. Anything we can do to assist those businesses that need help that are struggling right now, I think the city has a responsibility to do. We also have the responsibility to the residents in this town. And the rental assistance that has been um, 
they've partnered with CityServe to do that. And that's another nonprofit. So um, I think doing more to help our residents that are also struggling right now, and there are a lot, I think is, the, is what we need to do. Um, I know how the county is giving food at the fairgrounds um, here in town. And I know the nonprofit I work for has also been giving food. And that's been a real blessing to a lot of people. Um, child care is another issue that a lot of parents in town are having issues with. And I think the city should um, try to see what they can do to help with that as well. I think we need to continue looking at creative solutions. You know, the opening up of Main Street, as others have mentioned, have been, a, that's a good one. Um, is my time over? I don't see my clock. Yeah, I think that there's okay. something with the timer. I was trying to uh, try to do it on my own, but um, yeah, you only have five more seconds left for the timer I just put on my own. Um, okay. Minima is, oh, uh, are you able? Looking to, par looking to partner more with nonprofits and things like that. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know what happened. There was some kind of a glitch, so yeah. No, no. Uh, are, are, is it working out? Just, just give me a second. Let me check. Okay, thank you. And meanwhile, this guy. That's a, you have a big cat. So yeah, yeah he, he takes over my whole life. So that's, yeah, that's yeah. funny because well, when I get on Zoom, I have a dog that she has to sit on my lap when I'm on Zoom. So when, when I'm doing these forums, my wife has to take her outside. Otherwise, she's relentless. <laughs> Oh, no. Well, how about this? In the meantime, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, keep the timer. I'll go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and have uh, um, Mr. Balch. And I'll tell you when to stop. What's the question? Oh, I think I already answered this. He already one. did. Yeah. Yeah. I was the first oh, time I was left. You know what? You are absolutely three. correct. See, we're just having all sorts of fun tonight. Yeah. I can append <laughs> my answer. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me go ahead and put it to over here. And here we go. All right, so um, many people in Pleasanton have filed claims for unemployment um, or unemployment assistance claims and live in households with people who have lost work but don't have access to unemployment or, or other income and replacement. So how would Pleasanton address the issue of people facing homelessness once the eviction moratorium ends? And how do we currently help those who are homeless? And this question would go to Mr. Brown. Yes, thank you. Well, homeless is, homelessness is... This is a large scale, it's a statewide issue. It's actually even bigger than that. It's obviously a national issue, if not a global issue. As your council member, I would encourage our city staff to work closely with the state of California, our first responders, our local nonprofit agencies to identify those in need and connect them with resources that are available as quickly and efficiently as possible. Empowering our Health and Human Service Commission to network with other cities to establish regional resources and protocols would also be very helpful uh, as a strategy. Um, again, you know, networking with, with our nonprofits, I think is the best strategy that we have. And then as a city, we need to uh, continue to look at loans or grants that we can to help um, the people that need this. So this is something that, uh, it's definitely something that's gonna come up and that we will have to address. Thank you. Ms. Kizugalu? So housing is the one thing that uh, I've been pushing for as a housing commissioner for the last three years. So if elected in the council, I want to adopt new plans to rezone. I think uh, homelessness is just a side effect of the lack of affordable housing. I want to adopt new plans to rezone so, so that we can meet that statutory objective of RENA, which is affirmatively further housing, especially in our area where we have high jobs and high transportation and access to transportation, but no affordable housing. Our housing element will be updated in the general plan in December 2020. By May 21, 2021, basically, we will have two-year budget and the plan for capital improvement. And so the new arena is like 4,790 homes, and two-thirds of that is going to be affordable housing. When we have affordable housing on the ground, then we will be able to get rid of homelessness and lack of affordable housing, and that will be solved. But even with the next arena, a 5,000 home, we will not be able to solve housing crisis. This is, has been going on for too long, and we haven't done anything about it, and this is just the first step. Thank you. Mr. Lee? Yeah, I think, um, you know, this whole homelessness and housing issue, it's, it all ties into jobs, right? Jobs and, and ensuring that 
we support our local businesses so that they can thrive and grow and create more jobs. Uh, but in the short term, I think that um, this, as a city, we should look into maybe, you know, giving giving out vouchers to help people with homelessness. Um, vouchers that they could uh, bring over to the hotels that are not currently, you know, uh, in business. They could rent out those hotel rooms and that would kind of help the hotel industry as well. Mm. Um, but then on the long term, we should look at affordable housing, um, looking at how we can put more high density housing um, in areas like the East Pleasanton or Stone Ridge Mall, or just throughout um, Pleasanton. Um, and fu- uh, pulling that funding from the affordable housing fund. Thank you. Um, Ms. Arkin? Yes, thank you. I think one of the main things to help with um, the homeless population is the partnering with nonprofits. Um, I, I, like I mentioned before, I work for a nonprofit and we actually do deal with people that are homeless. So helping them either um, directly, we help with food, we help with childcare subsidies, um, we help with a lot of th- diapers, we help with a lot of things like that, but we also connect them to other agencies that can help. Um, we have a lot of women and children that we get into the shelters, which are over in Livermore, um, but we connect them with county services, the Alameda County Social Services, things that are of that nature. And that we need to continue to focus on and do more outreach with that in order to reach those populations. Um, I also think that um, housing assistance that the city should look into as the problem is growing, um, see what else the city can do with any type of assistance with getting them into appropriate housing, I think is something they should look at doing. And then there's the whole affordable housing piece, but I'm out of time. Thank you, Um, Mr. Balch. Yeah, thank you. Um, So in terms of the rental housing that's, the city's already doing, we, you know, they are evaluating, looking at uh, increasing that from my understanding, and I would be as well. So in terms of a short-term solution, I think that's something that for the people who are looking at the eviction uh, moratorium, that is something that we uh, need to be looking at if there's additional funding for that and how we could fund that, through maybe through the low-income housing funds. In terms of the homeless overall, right now, as you may recall, we have two officers who are assigned to assist the homeless. And with the mental health element that we are speaking about with the police and tri- partnering with the Tri-Valley with a CAHOOTS or the PER program to help them in that uh, situation if there's any uh, criminal element or even not, really just looking at the services there for identification and getting them places. But I do think we also need to partner with the nonprofits such as Open Heart Kitchen to be uh, looking for a bed and further services for these uh, people in need. Thank you so much. Um, Would that be, uh, did we get everybody? I'm sorry, I kind of got a little thrown off. Okay, great, perfect. So, Ms. uh, Mikizigalu, the next question would be for you. Um, Let me copy that. All right, the next question would be uh, from 1991 to 2018, Pleasanton's number of housing units went up from um, roughly 19,800 to 28,000, and the current rate of population growth is 0.52%. How do you plan on making room for this new population growth and what development plans do you have for balancing the increase in housing and people when there's only so much space to use? And then also a community member had asked, how will candidates promote access to fair housing during this time? a very high rent in inequality. Okay, so actually in 2010, the, uh, we are, our city got sued because we were not making affordable housing. So we went from 19,000 to 28, I think it's more like 24, 25,000. I don't think it's 28,000 all the housing. The population growth is 7,000 people and um, make room for, we have the East Pleasanton, 11, 1,100 acres. We have infill areas to build houses. And I'm not quite sure how, what the, this person is asking for, that we don't have place to grow. Um, 
So this is not making sense to me because it's completely against what I have seen. We have people who need affordable housing and we have 63,000 jobs and we only have 23, 24,000 homes in Pleasanton. Do not have affordable housing for people who work here. They're commuting and we're increasing greenhouse gas emission. That's the side effect of the fact that we have 63,000 jobs, 51,000 come and go every day. So that's Thank what you. I would say. Yeah. Mr. Lee? Yes. Um, how to fix affordable housing? Um, well, there is uh, this in lieu fee that developers pay is roughly about 44000 uh, to get out of building affordable housing uh, for developments. Um, so I, I would dip into that fund, pull out roughly about nine to 10 million and maybe look at partnering with um, the, the company Workday to look at building high density housing in, in the properties that they've purchased in the last, uh, I forget when, but a couple of years or so, I guess. Um, that's a great opportunity for them to invest in the uh, community and really resolve some of the housing issues. They could build, you know, portion for their employees, maybe some office buildings, um, some condos, but then also a, a good amount of affordable housing for the community. And that's earmarked only for like below market rate uh, rentals or something like that. Um, that's enough. Thank you. Ms. Arkin? Yes, thank you. Well, I am in favor of more affordable housing. And as our RENA numbers come out next year, um, I would advocate as a city council member to build more affordable housing. Um, we do have a lot of luxury housing already in Pleasanton and there is the need for affordable. So. I would advocate for that. I am also um, um, against the in-lieu fees. Um, uh, and I, I think builders need to build the affordable when they have a project come forward. Um, locations are important. I think locations near transportation hubs, which BART, near BART, near freeways, that sort of thing um, is one thing to look at. And when we talk about affordable housing, uh, you know, it includes multifamily housing, but I'm also a big advocate of inclusionary housing which are kind of, if, if people aren't familiar with that, it's kind of duplexes in a way that are mixed in with market rate housing. Um, I think that's a great way for a, you know, people to have a path to home ownership that otherwise wouldn't be able to afford it. But also senior housing and housing for um, adults with special needs. Another Thank one. you. Mr. Balch? Yeah, this is not an answer that's a one minute answer, Pleasanton. So I would just point that out. So I'm a planning commissioner. I've been a planning commissioner for six years, and we've been working on this exact challenge. In general, uh, I should mention that the city does not build anything. The city actually zones, and then they have to wait for a developer, either a nonprofit or for-profit developer, to actually come and put forth the project. So when we look at how to solve our housing challenges, it is a zoning and density question and issue. RENA numbers are generally um, directionally known to be a 235% increase over the last or current RENA cycle that we're ending. And so when we look at that, my goal would be to try to encourage a variety of housing mix so that we have housing for every quality, uh, uh, place in life that you are. So we have the apartments and affordability at the beginning, and then we have the small single family and we move up from there. And where it goes is a matter of how dense you want your housing to be. And we need to be looking at schools and traffic locations. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Well, housing, again, is another very complex issue and it's an important one. Pleasanton will receive its regional housing needs assessment allocation numbers uh, shortly. And well, we actually know what they are, but it'll be a requirement shortly. These numbers will firmly dictate the number of new housing units that will need to be zoned within our city and include included in that our housing element by January 2023. This is important because it shapes the future of our housing and also creates opportunities for conversations in the coming years. Personally, I would advocate for income-based housing that serves the needs of our veterans, seniors, workforce, and developmentally disabled, as well as uh, a broad variety of other Homes. This is a critical need for our community and something we have an obligation to address. I have a strong, uh, I have been a strong advocate for Sunflower, Sunflower Hill in their community. I would love to see more projects like this in our community. 
and I'm out of time. So Mina, you're on mute. Oh, there you are. No. Oh, of course. Uh, so the next question that would go to Mr. Lee was traffic has become increasing issue in Pleasanton. How would you work to alleviate traffic? Um, yes, I would focus more on public transportation. Um, you know, put in more electric buses, uh, bus routes uh, that would go to BART and ACE train. Uh, I don't think that's highly marketed in, in Pleasanton. So that would be one area of opportunity. Um, you know, also looking at maybe hiring some traffic consultant experts to kind of look at why we're having traffic issues in the city and kind of come up with some solution to reduce traffic. Um, I know that we were looking into um, these kind of smart signals, I guess. Um, I, I don't think that uh, I haven't heard any news that they've been launched yet or not, but um, I think that's one great idea. We just need to learn and, and try out new technologies, bring in professionals to help us with these traffic issues. Um, yeah, to, to relieve it, I guess. That's all I have. <laughs> thank you. Um, so Ms. Arkin? Yes, thank you. Um, well, regionally, I think, you know, Highway 84 needs to be finished. So there are some things regionally that will, as a result, indirectly will help Pleasanton. Um, I'm assuming the question is more related to Pleasanton, though. So with Pleasanton, I think, yeah, there are a lot of um, timing of lights that could be done better. I think there are a lot of, um, and actually, I brought this up to the city council recently, um, actually, to one of my city liaison meetings that I'm uh, I, I am on as a school board member with city council members, and I brought up about certain intersections in town that are quite congested during commute hours and what can be done about that. And I know the city is starting to look at that, and I, I think they always look at that, actually, but there are some that really need a little more attention to, um, whether it's another you know, a left turn lane added, a lane expanded, things like that. I think we need to concentrate more on those types of things. Um, public transportation and get people to take BART, I, I think it is is good too. I know with COVID that, you know, that ridership is down right now, but that's another good avenue as well. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Balch? Yeah, so uh, we want more housing, but we don't want the traffic that comes with it, right? So it's a little bit of a challenge. Uh, so we have a professional traffic engineer on staff. And when we evaluate projects for the planning commission, we do look at the traffic impacts. But we also are in a unique geographical location with traffic through the Alameda County as an entirety from, uh, as we know, the hill and the Altamont Pass. So I look at things such as the cut through traffic associated with Highway um, 84. We need to complete Highway 84 with a second lane is already planned from Pigeon Pass to 680. We need to be looking at the Valley Link and supporting that. And those uh, getting those traffic cut through off of our streets will help us. We're not gonna be widening high, uh, First Street or Main Street. And so then my other comment is locally, I was supportive of pocket lots in the downtown to spread um, parking throughout the linear downtown. So the people are not circling looking for the same parking spot. I'm out of time. Thank you, um, Mr. Brown. Traffic mitigation is an, and alleviation is an ongoing focus in our community. We, a lot of people talk about that and are concerned about it. Our city staff has been and will continue to address our traffic issues as our city grows. And Jack said it perfectly. You know, we want to talk about housing, but, you know, along with that is going to come more traffic. I do support increased infrastructure for alternative uh, modes of transportation so that we can as a maybe as a bike and pedestrian pedestrian friendly um, atmosphere, we've done a really good job with that. But again, looking at and completing Highway 84 to help alleviate that cut through traffic, potentially a flyover for Highway 580 because that's where most of our cut through traffic comes from, is because of the congestion on uh, getting on 580 or off of 580 onto 680. Uh, it, it's it is a nightmare, but regional transit needs that we have and i absolutely am supportive of bringing in uh valley link all the way into the uh into the san joaquin area so that we can have that thank you right. mr kizikalu 
Yeah, so traffic. I think the reason we have a problem with traffic is 580. We are sandwiched between 580 and 680. And the main reason is because we have a lack of affordable housing. We do not have housing. If everybody does their fair share building, if everybody, people will not be commuting to Sacramento or going to Stockton or going to Lodi to commute, and they don't need to cut through Pleasanton or any other places. So not just only Pleasanton, but all cities in the Bay Area, there nobody is doing their fair share of building affordable housing. People are forced into being in their cars for hours. And in Pleasanton, I'm sorry, p- traffic is nothing compared to the Bay Area where, uh, where uh, San-, San Jose, Santa Clara. We are worried about three minute delay where they're sitting on the traffic for half an hour, 45 minutes. So we are not even there within the city. Okay, we have great traffic inside. Once in a while, there's a traffic jam, there's an accident, but we do not have that. As a region, we are not building an affordable housing. That's why we have the freeway congestion and the roads are clogged the way they are. All right, thank you. Uh, so this next question is gonna go to Ms. Arkin. Uh, climate change has become even more apparent with the terrible fires affecting California. What changes would you implement to protect the environment? And this could go for multiple things, like whether it be water or you know fire or other issues like trash. So please. Sure, okay, thank you. Uh, well, protecting the environment is very important to me and a big priority of mine. Uh, one thing, um, we have a committee of uh, the committee on energy and the environment um, with the city. I would actually like to see that turned into a commission. Actually, so I think that's important enough to be a commission. Um, I'm also personally endorsed by the Sierra Club, and as I said, I've, I'm very, you know, I very much want to protect our environment in a lot of ways. No building on our ridges. That's something that we do have a measure that is protected, and I would stand by that and do whatever I can to make sure that's never overturned. Um, promoting solar in town, I think is another good environmental. Um, I know like with, I got solar in my house and the city helped pay for it. So uh, there are city incentives to do that as well. Um, I would also expand this into the safe drinking water issue with the contaminants that were found in our water. And of course that, wa- that well was shut off and the zone seven one has been blended. So it's below the regulatory amounts, but uh, supporting infrastructure and, and looking at other ways that we can protect the health and safety of residents is of utmost importance. Thank you, Mr. Belch. Yeah, so the city is undertaking a climate action plan at this exact time. So if you are interested in participating in this and are watching at home, your voice can be voiced to that plan through the city's website. And I encourage you to do that. It is a major issue, and I think we've discovered it or become more apparent uh, with the air quality and the heats that we have been facing. The city currently has an irrigation assistance program so that you don't overwater your lawn. And through Zone 7, they have in the past had lawn conversions to drought-tolerant landscape, things that I would hope to support and keep growing. There was a solar assistance program offered by the city, and I would like to see that continue as well in the future. But transportation remains the largest polluter in our area. And I think that the Valley Link is one way where we can look at it, where we get these vehicles that are on 580 sitting next to our city off that road and stop dumping their tailpipe emissions into our city. Uh, In addition, I strongly support the clean water concepts that we've been discussing. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Climate change is a very complex issue, and I believe it's much more of a global issue uh, than it is a city level issue, but there are certainly some things that we can do and focus on, and I think the city has uh, and is doing some a good job there. There are some things that we can do, like increasing our recycled water program. I think that we do a great job, but we can increase that, which would be huge because every every gallon of water that we recycle, it's a gallon that we're not pumping out of, out of our aquifers. Um, supporting our Go Green initiative, our recycle programs, and continue to look at more sustainable project products when we're doing our building. Um, we, Valerie has a good idea as far as solar, but you know all new projects that are being built, they do require solar. So we, that part's taken care of on the new construction, but we do need to promote solar on existing construction as well. Uh, I agree that that getting rid of tailpipe emissions is huge. I think technology is coming along with, oh, I'm out of time. 
Thank you. Ms. Pizzicolo? Sorry. Yeah, so along with the water and the climate change is real, and it's uh, because of the cars in this area, uh, 51,000 cars, just to our city, just our city, imagine other cities. So we need uh, solar panels for all the new constructions and the businesses, uh, parking lot, parking over with the solar roofs like we've seen around the city, uh, removing natural gas from the stoves and water heaters that's going to, um, that's heating. The heating system is also another way of uh, reducing and holding PG accountable for carbon-free electricity. That's a huge thing that we haven't uh, we haven't even looked into. Uh, and so travel, do less traveling via uh, airplane. So if from one way from London to uh, JFK, it's like if you go to business class, like 3,684 kilograms of carbon dioxide. Then if you go uh, business class is 2,671 kilograms of carbon dioxide. So do more Zoom and uh, Skype uh, business uh, meetings uh, to reduce carbon um, and you reuse, recycle. Uh, those are the best way. Thank you. Um, oh, okay, Mr. Lee. Yes. So, um, yeah, water for me is a big deal. Um, I, I think that we need to install these filtration systems now um, versus three years later down the road. And we need to demand from Zone 7 and our, our own city safe, clean and chemical free drinking water because PFAS is a big issue. Not only that, in the future, we're going to see microplastics uh, in our waters. It, it's actually in our waters now but it's going to become an issue in the future. So uh, filtration for our waters is uh, number one. Uh, number two is looking at what sort of investments will get the most bang for bucks, right? Because um, reducing uh, carbon emissions is, is, there's, is been done before. There's solar panels with battery backups, electric trucks, uh, electric shuttles, planting more trees. So I would look into, um, you know, submitting proposals to see what can we do, how much we can invest and go with the most carbon emission reduction program that we could afford. Thank you. Uh, so this next question would go to Mr. Balch first. And it's a community question that was asked in the chat or in the Q&A section. Main Street businesses are suffering. Uh, here, I just did it according to whatever you, um, you wrote. So Main Street businesses are suffering here in every other city. To expect to solve all their problems is unrealistic. What would you what would you all or any of you do to help our businesses to survive? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I think this kind of goes back to our earlier conversation about COVID-19, right? So each business is unique. Each business rental agreement or ownership agreement with their landlords uh, is unique. And so I don't think the city would be able to be an effective uh, intermediary completely with that. But the business support systems that just got increased in the funding available to our businesses, I do support that. And I think we need to keep that up and be looking at what we can do there. The second part of that is we're opening up Main Street for our businesses, but it required the city's cooperation to support that. Closing down the street is something the city is taking on as a responsibility. And I think we need to be looking at that both in downtown and where we as a city can assist in, in the permitting process or application process to allow other businesses to open up and, uh, and get back to work as best as they can. It would be impossible to have a, a solution to fit all, but we can definitely try to solve or help as many as possible. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Um, I'm sorry, I was reading a question. You, This is a different question that I thought you had. Can you repeat that question for me, please? So I, I wrote it in the chat. So Main Street <laughs> businesses are suffering here and every other, sorry, my- my. Um, okay, I see that question. Wires right. is uh, covering it. So you're able to see it? Yeah, I did, I saw that question. So okay. yes, I, I'm i a, a chamber board chair and I'm also on the PDA and we worked very hard to to, like I said earlier, to get Main Street closed down so that we could open that, uh, open it up to businesses, not only restaurants, but also retailers. It's something that I think that we need to look at as, a, as an annual thing because it's really helping to increase uh, business and revenues for all. A lot of restaurants that I have talked to and polled have said that they're actually having better 
uh, participation, better, better numbers right now than they than than they they ever had. I would like to look at maybe even making Main Street a one way in the future, so that we can increase the space coming in on the sidewalks. We could probably add about six feet six feet of space on either side, and that would help give businesses the ability to expand their footprint and help them grow and, and be able to do more, more business in the future and be more safe about it because of the air being outside and having air movement is going to help all. You're muted. Ms. Kizigalu? Yes, so uh, we have to understand that uh, the barriers that existed that prevent some business from getting paycheck protection program, PPP, from the last stimulus package. So I guess we have, we have to understand that first. Uh, we have to offer more uh, utility rate discounts. We can offer uh, tax deduction. We can offer tax credits with incentives to hire individuals from targeted group youth, SSI recipients, SNAP recipients. And we can provide grants and loans uh, by small business administ administration to help some of these groups. We could also offer incentives, but some business will decide to leave. Because what we find out, the surveys have shown that 57% of small business owners have increased their concern about their own mental health. So they're worn out. Small businesses feel un uneasy, anxious, confused, and they're sensing a uh, sense of loss. They're looking for external factors to help them. For example, new government assistance programs, easing the government uh, restrictions or vaccines. So those are real issues and um, it's complicated. It can't be answered one minute, but some things to look at. Uh, Mr. Lee? Yeah, I wanted to echo what Zarina said. That's very true. Small businesses are struggling and they need to make ends meet. And that's why I propose to build this sort of task force made out of volunteers to help small businesses navigate the COVID recovery and the COVID response. Uh, what, what type of permitting, what type of uh, zero interest loans or grants they could apply for. But I think what the city can do, aside from the task force, is really to ensure that ensure the safety of the community and make sure that we have enough policies that will enforce wearing masks outdoors, social distancing, um, you know, um, uh, everything else related to that. So that when you ensure safety and give the consumers confidence, they will go to the main street and so, um, go to, um, you know, help out the businesses and, and go to the restaurants. But I think we could do better in that area and just, you know, promoting more uh, consumer confidence is, is something the city can do. Thank you. Ms. Arkin? Yes, thank you. Okay, yeah, this is kind of similar to our earlier question. So with the uh, COVID recovery type of thing. So some of it's a little bit of a repeat with helping the struggling businesses with um, with the no interest loans, anything we can do to assist them in getting through the crisis we're currently having. And we want them to stay open. We, we want to protect our downtown. So anything we can do, looking at more creative solutions. And one of them has been the opening up of downtown um, to the outside so that restaurants can have more patronage. Um, things like that. I, you know, I talked to one business that I, I frequent down on, on Main Street and um, they said their business is actually down more than when it opened up, and I don't know why. Um, I, I know the parking is an issue, so that probably has to be addressed. But I would say, you know, one of the things I would do is let's ask the businesses, what what could the city do to assist? What other solutions could we do to help them? So I think that would be a key thing, um, you know, asking the stakeholders involved. Uh, Mr. Bolch? I think this one started with me, by the way. Okay. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I thought it was Mr. Brown who had started with that one. That's okay. okay. He did a good answer, too. All right. There you go. Um, all right. Then I get, oh, yes, you are correct. Yes. So then, I'll, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Brown, if you could answer this one. Um, so it's a combination between a community question and, and our question. So racist and hate incidences have been on the rise, especially throughout the pandemic and getting closer to the election. What efforts have you made to combat racism and Islamophobia? And what will you do as a council member to tackle the issue? And then the community question is, the demography of um, uh, Tri-Valley is changing. Um, what kind of multiracial education and tolerance will you promote so that we can get along and grow amiable? 
Well, I believe that 2020 has been a year of listening and learning. We've done a really good job of doing that when it comes to the policing issues. And we need to certainly have a deep and personal reflection for everyone. As a society and a community, we are taking we need to take a hard look at these areas in which we need to improve and we need to work towards full inclusivity. Uh, as a civic leader in Pleasanton, I will always listen, learn, and work for equality for everyone. There certainly is a lot of work to be done. I'm excited for the future. I want to be part of that and, and the positive changes that are possible. As far as things that we that I have done or that I feel like we can done, I certainly think that I, I do understand that our that our demographic is changing as an agent. I'm seeing a lot of new uh, faces come in and I can see a lot of other races, uh, a lot of multi-races coming in and the diversity is changing. Uh, as far as education, that's a good question. I hadn't thought of that, but uh, I think that we need to work with the schools and make sure, sorry, I'm out of time. Thank you, Ms. Kizikula. So yeah, so in Pleasanton, unfortunately, for better or worse, we think that we are melting pot. And I was talking to Jack and Farmer's Market. I said that we are very segregated, unfortunately. We need to embrace each other and through understanding and program, we have to work with each other. And my third leg of campaign is a diversity and inclusion community center that will address all of these issues. Um, so it's just unfortunate that, you know, uh, in the middle of school here, we have uh, the Asian parents have their own WhatsApp group, the Indians have their own WhatsApp group, and the white groups have their own, they hang out together. An Iranian American friend actually was kicked out of the Indian WhatsApp group because she was not Iranian. And she had the same kid, a kid going on the same middle school, same program, and not just included. That's just not right. Um, so, you know, I've talked to principals, teachers. Uh, we have racism in the schools. We have racism at the, um, in the teachers. So this is an issue that is, uh, we have to combat and you have to, we have to work through it. And it's through education and program, and we have to bring up the difficult issues. Uh, Mr. Lee? Yeah, one of the main reasons why I'm running is that, um, you know, I, I, I did see the national level, there was a lot of racism uh, and a lot of racism toward Asian. Um, and I decided, you know, the only way you can stop that is get a seat on the table. And that's why I'm running for city council. You know, if I'm there, at least I can speak to the Asian community and give a different point of view. Um, as far as the education. Um, when I was working at Goodwill San Francisco, we were in a lot of leadership and uh, training programs. And there was two that might help Pleasanton and its staff is unconscious bias training and diversity and inclusion training. Um, that definitely helped me. Even me being an Asian American, I had some unconscious bias that I identified. So I think that everyone uh, city workers should go through that. Police officers definitely needs to go through that type of training quarterly at a minimum. Ms. Arkin? Yes, thank you. Well, first of all, I think as a community, we can't tolerate any racism of any kind. Um, and so I think, you know, we need to hold people accountable, people that do commit any sort of acts or any sort of anything in regards to racism. Um, me as a, uh, as a school board member, we have done a lot in the school district to educate our staff and our students. I mean, we have a lot. We have anti-bullying curriculum. We have all kinds of multicultural types of uh, uh, celebrations, but also other, other things in classrooms. We have um, SEED, it's called. It's Seeking Educational Equity and Diversity. I think I have that right. That is for our staff and for our students. We, we pass resolutions all the time at the school board. Um, I think, you know, we need to increase public awareness at council meetings. I think that's what I would do as a city council member. Um, more education in the city and the school district is always good. The training for police with diversity training and implicit bias training, I think, is very important. And lastly, I would say encourage diverse groups to get involved, and we do more outreach in order to get them involved. Thank you. Mr. Balch? Yeah, you know, uh, this whole thing saddens me terribly. And, and um, the thing I told a different group on a different forum that I did is be the change you want to be. And uh, the one thing that I made sure I did was talk to my 12-year-old son about what 
um, what all of this means and how it's not a value that I hold in, in our family. Um, all of these things that all these candidates have said, we have to try all of them. We have to do something more than just what any one of us can find because it is so critical. Diversity is our strength in this city. And we're having that challenge of getting people involved. It's been part of my message from the very first beginning. I have sat at meetings where we have pleaded for people to be a part of this community. And I do encourage that. So all of these things, they're all good ideas. But uh, I hope we can show kindness as a city. Thank you. So this will be the last question um, before your uh, final comment. And so it is um, after the officer involved shootings um, and killings of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Stephen Taylor, among others, Pleasanton Police has received a D score on the Campaign Zero scorecard for police violence. There have been greater calls to reimagine, defund, or even eliminate police. Do you believe that changes need to be made with local police departments and training? And if so, what suggested training changes uh, would you make? And this would go to uh, Ms. Kizaglu. So the police, yes. We uh, community got together in the city council a few times and they asked for to, um, they don't want, the students, they don't want the DARE program. We are one of the only public schools or community who still has the DARE, that old archaic program. And we have uh, a police officers on campus. So they, they didn't want those two things. And unfortunately, the city council said they're going to look at more into it instead of just easy. It would have been just easy. Just make a motion, get rid of the programs, use the money for mental health programs and social services. That's a, such an easy thing to do. Community students spoke, 50 to 100 of them spoke in multiple sessions. We have to make bold improvements in our communities. Just putting it, hashing it away and putting it aside and waiting for the next community to come talk over and over and over, it's not going to solve the problem. We have a systemic racism in this society, in this community, and the whole entire country. We have to get rid of it. And the only way we can do it, if we do some kind of reform within the police departments and teaching. Thank you. Um, Mr. Lee? Uh, yes, I think the local police is doing a great job ensuring our safety. And I do not support defunding the police. Um, but I do think that we need to add more training. Um, there is unconscious bias and there is police brutality and we just need to call it out when it happens. You know, don't hide it. Um, so definitely more training, um, mental health training. Um, they're already on the path towards bringing in mental health kind of uh, task force or, or, or um, the word Anyways, mental health help is uh, what they're bringing in. But I think that uh, the police staff also needs these kind of mental health health checks once in a while, right? Because they're under a lot of stress and some police might even have PTSD and we need to call that out and identify it and help the police um, do that. And if they are kind of stressed out, get them off, put them on vacations and, and you know, just move forward with that. Thank you, um, Ms. Arkin. Yes, thank you. I do think there needs to be some changes and some reform in in, our, in the police in Pleasanton. Um, I do think there needs to be, and I kind of look at it as three a three prong approach. One is the oversight. So the city council recently voted to have more uh, the city council having more oversight, which they ha should have been doing all along, and they haven't. So that is one step in the right direction. I was also in favor of, and I spoke up about having the independent police auditor. They did not vote to do that. I wish they would have because I that would add one layer, extra layer of oversight without being too intrusive. Um, and like others have said, we all value a safe community, of course. Um, but I think adding health and mental health professionals to help people um, in crisis is something that is absolutely needed and I would advocate for. I also think the evaluation of police policies, they need to be done on a regular basis, just like policies anywhere. And that hasn't been done in many, many years. So that has started and I'm, I will advocate for more of that. Um, and just to po point out the SROs and DARE program, we need to look at the data first and there will be the city and school district working together to look at that issue. Thank you. Mr. Bulch? 
Yeah, so um, the city has gone through, obviously, a very healthy conversation, and I hope it is only the beginning of our conversations related to policing in our community. There were a couple of listening sessions, as we know, then there was a uh, evaluation of the policies and procedures, and then there was the 21st century policing. But all of that takes where we don't let it, um, we don't let it fall by the wayside. Healthy policing for our community will require us to continue to look at these things as we look at all our, our issues. And I support that. I do not support defunding the police in any way. As 90% of their budget goes to officers or personnel costs, any defunding would likely lead to an increase in response time, and I do not support that. We look at the smashing grabs or the thefts we have during the holidays of our packages on our porches, and I don't see how that's what our community would like. I do support the idea of mental health, the implicit bias training. All of these things are good ideas. And Mr. Brown? Given the state and national statistics indicating increased incidence of mental health-related public uh, safety calls, I am a strong advocate for supplementing, and I mean supplementing, not defunding or reallocating our top-tier police department with access to mental health professionals, and that will complement our officers and their efforts to keep our community safe. Uh, I believe that we still need to have a uh, fully um, outfitted officer to, to assist in those calls, as a lot of the mental health calls go uh, a, in a bad direction. I have a personal um, experience. My grandmother was stabbed six times by uh, a mental health uh, patient that, was, that the police were called out on. So having an armed officer is crucial. Um, with that. I do support our Pleasanton Police Department and want to ensure they always have an, uh, uh, that they have an effective in serving the public continually to seek out and adopt best practices. And I'm going to take it. Thank you. All right. So the final question of the evening, and that goes to Mr. Lee. Um, without discussing, discussing your competitors, please tell us why we should vote for you. All right, great. I want to thank you for having me here. Um, so I run a clean money campaign that is fully funded by my family, my friends, supporters, and myself. I'm a passionate citizen that just felt that it was the right time for me to run because I want to sit at the table and I want to make some changes. Um, you know, people of color need to speak out um, and you can't be quiet and expect changes. You need to take a stand, uh, make a change, and get your seat at the table. Um, I have experience as a director of sustainability, director of operations. I know how to manage budgets. Um, I was on a nonprofit board. I'm also a current advisory committee member for a National Stewardship Action Council. So I will fight for the environment. I will fight for Pleasanton, and I will fight for the community. And um, if you vote me and elect me, I will definitely be your voice on the city council. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Arkin. Okay, thank you. Well, I have a I have been involved in city issues and civic engagement for over two decades. Uh, my 12 years experience on the school board, which I'm currently in, my eight years of experience on the library commission numerous volunteer organizations in town I've been involved in and numerous volunteering in schools and whatnot. I have a proven track record of leadership. I was elected three times to the school board. I've been president of the school board three times and vice president three times. I'm the only one that has been elected and I'm the only one that's been accountable to the public with taxpayer funds. I've had to make very tough budget decisions, including budget reductions, personnel decisions. I've had to, from hiring the superintendent to approving every personnel in a decision in the district. Um, I've had experience negotiating with two different unions. Um, I've worked collaboratively, collaboratively as a team to get things done. I've been responsive and accessible to the public, and I listen to all sides of an issue. I have a vi wide variety of stakeholders. I've been teachers, parents, community members that I've, I've been in. Okay, I guess I'm out of time. And I have a background in science and business. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Bolt. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, hopefully by now you have an understanding of who I am and maybe what I stand for a little bit more. 
I'm also a licensed certified public accountant and a chartered global management accountant. I've been serving Pleasanton for 11 years as both a parks and recreation commissioner for shortly or less than five and a planning commissioner currently for just over six years, for 11 years of service. I have been listening to residents of Pleasanton that whole time, and I've been putting Pleasanton first during that time. So why you should vote for me is that we have unique challenges this election, both with arena housing and with our city budget and trying to assist our residents and businesses. And that is going to take strong financial acumen to be able to accomplish that. And I believe that is one of my largest strengths. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Well, our future, our future requires leaders with a deep sense of integrity, with leaders with who will embrace a collaborative spirit and who will approach each situation with an unbiased perspective. I believe in my profession, I am a I'm a trained professional to listen. I'm a trained professional that looks for needs of their clients and then and then negotiates through those leads, uh, those needs. I'm eager to bring my unique background, my uh, military experience, my business experience, and my fiduciary leadership coupled with community volunteerism. The, all the volunteerism and the roles that I have played serving on several boards with Valley Care, uh, with the Chamber of Commerce, and, and many other organizations, Rotary, I'm a past president, um, and I will bring that experience and that leadership to the city council. I'm eager to make decisions based on the greatest good of Pleasanton and its community and the citizens and ensure our processes are transparent and equitable for all. Thank you. And last but not least, Ms. Kizigalu. Yes, so I'm a housing commissioner and I have a master's in public administration with emphasis on policy analysts. I believe that it's time to make some changes, real changes in this pressing time and these difficult uh, issues that we are encountering. Some old things will not work, and it has not worked. Change is what we look forward and what we need in this community. How fast we recover from this economic downtime will hinge on how inclusive and equitably, equitably we work together through these issues. This pandemic, wildfires, and protests for racial justice are highlighting the urgent needs for our region to ensure good health and prosperity for all Bay Area, no matter what comes our way. Our region's current patterns of racial and economic segregation have made it clear and easy to see that COVID and job losses, police brutality, are devastating Black and Latinx communities, minorities. We need to come together in this moment and reroute the Bay Area towards a future where we all are safe, healthy, and taking care of each other. Go. It's what I'm saying. That's what I was going to say. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to all of the candidates who joined us tonight for the Pleasanton Candidate Forum. Uh, if you missed any part of it and want to rewatch it, you can find it on our Facebook. Um, and you can also find um, some other uh, events and webinars that we've hosted about, like Know Your Rights at the ballot polls, Know Your Rights uh, for other issues as well. Um, and then also issues about Prop 15, Prop 16, Prop 17. Um, so we have um, webinars about that. Um, you can check out also our voter guides, uh, both the statewide and the um, and the local ones as well on our website. We'd like to thank you uh, and thank um, our co-sponsors, who is MCC East Bay, uh, San Ramon Valley Islamic Center, the Northern California Islamic Center, and Muslim American Society. Um, and uh, please reach out to us if you have any questions. Um, have a wonderful evening. Thank you again. Thank and thank you, you to Minna for thank being the timekeeper. Have to thank her. <laughs> All right. Have a wonderful evening now. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank, thank you. you. Good night. Good night. Thank you.